Phil is saying, um, honestly, it's an honor to be here. Uh, it's an honor to know all of you. Uh, I know that when this started out, it was a handful of people in a room. Today, we are two years into our project, and we have dozens and dozens and dozens of people who are involved throughout the nation, some throughout the world. And none of this, none of this would have been possible without all your support and all the things you've done to help us out. And honestly, I thank, I thank God for you all. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for all the work that you do and everything that you brought to this organization. This would not be possible without you. Uh, that being said, Combating Hegemony, Hearts and Minds, a presentation by the Center for Political Innovation. So first, we want to start with the content and context. So we want to briefly illustrate the historical material development of US hegemony. We want to construct a brief understanding of multilateralism as a requisite facet of institutional development. And finally, we want to discuss the importance of establishing new ideas and tackling the fundamental aspects of US hegemony, utilizing strategic goals and initiatives. But first, we've got to talk about the big thing, in the, in the big elephant in the room, US hegemony then and now. This is a brief synopsis of US hegemony as it exists, as it existed, and what it will look like in the future. So this is the brief history, <laughs> just the brief history of US hegemony. Uh, beginning at the end of World War II, really to the present, right? We have the collapse of fascism in Europe. We have the re reconstruction of capitalism, the creation of the IMF, the World Bank, the Bretton Woods conflicts in 1944. And of course, we have the occupation of Western Europe, the occupation of Japan. Uh, I can keep going, you know, the Korean War, the creation of NATO, the containment policy, the, you know, fiasco in Vietnam, uh, the various interventions in between, the sort of trying to reconcile with the communist bloc and sort of not ever doing that ever. <laughs> and then, of course, we have uh, the fall of the Soviet Union and then the blowback from all the things we've done, right? The war on terror, you know, the invasion of Afghanistan, the invasion of Iraq, the interventions in the Middle East. All that's kind of led to where we are today, right? Now we have a, a peace treaty with the Taliban. But we'll go on that in just a little bit. But first, let's start from the very beginning. So the era of American hegemony, 1945 to 2021. Now, at the end of the Second World War, the United States of America would singularly come to possess roughly 52% of the world's wealth in 1945. Now, let me reiterate that again for, for effect here. At the end of the Second World War in 1945, over half the wealth <laughs> on planet Earth was controlled by one nation, our nation. And you can imagine that's a pretty big deal. It, to put that in perspective, if you were to take $20-$21 today, that would be the entire economy of the United States, the entire economy of Japan, and the entire economy of the Russian Federation combined. And you might come close to the equivalent of the power and wealth the United States had at the end of World War II in 1945. It's a pretty big deal. With the industrialized nations of Europe and Japan having been devastated at the, by the war, it seemed as though international capitalism was once again in danger of collapse as the international marketplace had been ruined by the conflict's aftermath. So remember what led to World War II, right? The Great Depression, the rise of fascism, ultranationalism, these aspects combating the issues that they were facing at, at the time uh, of, of the Great Depression led to the rise of Nazism, fascism, etc. eventually led to this massive conflict which destroyed much of the industrialized world. 50 million people died in Europe during World War II. Two and a half million people died in Japan. That's not including the 11.5 million people who died in China. And that's, that's a conservative estimate. It could be up to 19. And we know that, that was a huge percentage of the world's population. The mass, the mass devastation that had taken place had literally uh, trampled the entire mechanism of global capital at that time. And it was up to the United States to find a way to rebuild capital, because without global markets, you really can't have global capitalism. So the United States sought to rebuild the shattered global market by investing in the reconstruction of Europe and Japan, both as a means of preserving, the interna uh, preserving international capitalism and as a bulwark against communism. Global financial institutions were established, such as the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, 
With the threat, but with the threat of international socialism still looming, a strategy of containment had been developed in order to preserve this new system of global capital. I want to go back real quick to the previous slide. This image right here, that's an image of Dresden, Germany, in 1945. Uh, Dresden had been uh, firebombed by the Allies, been completely destroyed. Germany had been completely destroyed. It was a cataclysmic event. World War II is a cataclysmic event throughout Europe. And that's not including, you think this is bad, you know, look at the Soviet Union. You know, two thirds of its industries were destroyed. 20 some odd million people had died in the Soviet Union. This clearly was a massive conflict. We fast forward here, we see the development of the aftermath, right? We see the rise of socialism. Oh no, we go back here. We see the rise of socialism, we see the rise of countries adopting anti-fascist views because what, what had fascism brought them? Fascism had brought them destruction. These countries in Europe had been completely annihilated. Their economies were destroyed. People were starving. People didn't want to associate with the nationalists and the fascists. They wanted to associate with the people who liberated them. They wanted to associate with the movement for socialism. And so you see the rise of socialist movements in Eastern Europe, even in Western Europe. In France, at the end of World War II, the Communist Party of France was one of the most popular political institutions in all of the nation. And they had fought the hardest <laughs> against the Malice and against you know, pro-right-wing pro organizations who had collaborated with Nazi Germany. And there was a real threat seen by the United States that these organizations, these communist organizations, were going to actually take over the world. It's a real thing. It's a real possibility. That, and they really legitimately thought that. And so they developed the system of containment. I'm not going to get too much into it because I have a whole other presentation to, about containment. But the long and short of it is that uh, containment was a doctrine developed by the United States to make sure we hold the communist nations at bay. And while this was going on, a ton of money and a ton of resources were, were plopped in. If you go back to that picture, uh, this is actually a very famous photograph from the Battle of Inshan during the invasion there. This gentleman right here, he was climbing over. He's actually a Medal of Honor recipient. He also died at the Battle of Inshan minutes after this photo was taken. A lot of people, Americans, had died in the course of conflict in order to contain communist aggression, quote unquote. And a lot of that has to do with you know, the, the, the interest of global capital. So the United States would go on to reshape the global economy in ways no other nation in history had the capacity of achieving. While undermining the capabilities of the developing world and of the communist bloc, the acquiescence of neoliberal economic development became the dominant economic mode of development from the last quarter century onward. So in the later half of the 20th century, with the, with the, the, the development of you know, the IMF and the World Bank and the new neoliberal economic mode of development, you see all these aspects of banking and finance, American capital, American steel, American guns, American money being used to prop up this global system. But we'll get into why that could be an issue going forward. But with the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991 came a period of unipolar ascendancy unlike anything that had been seen in history. While short-sighted headlines exclaimed the end of history, the gradual rolling back of material gains and sovereignty made in parts of the world once free from US hegemony were quickly subsumed by the global neoliberal economic regime, being perpetuated by institutions like the IMF and the World Bank. US strategic power had reached its zenith with military installations in almost 80 countries, including much of the former Warsaw Pact. So people heard this idea of the peace dividend after the end of the Cold War. There would be a reduction of force. There would be a reduction of, of troops as they are overseas, a reduction of spending militarily. We can finally live in an era of peace now that we've lived in the end of, end of history. Instead of returning soldiers from Korea and Japan, instead of all those things, we got more troops sent. In, in, interventions in, in Yugoslavia and in Somalia, interventions in countries throughout the 90s, uh, the, the, sh the shock doctrine capital in Eastern Europe, especially in the Russian Federation, supported by a lot of people who sold their country out. You know, all of that, those aspects, are part of the violence that came in the post-Cold War with the, with the quote unquote American victory in, the, in, that, in that perceived conflict. And the idea that things got somewhat better after the Cold War, after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. I think that's a huge lie. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind as we move forward. And then we move on to the cost of empire. Well, when I refer to the cost of empire, I'm referring really the cost of empire to us as Americans, right? Uh, we can talk about all the wars that have been waged, all the, the dollars and cents that have been spent fighting wars in, in overseas. 
But there's also a cost to us as regular working class people, a cost to us as individuals, and how, what, it, what it requires us, what it requires from us uh, as a system. Well, of course, there's the cost of maintenance and operation of the strategic assets that take priority over societal needs and aspirations, including health care and housing and education and quality of life, right? There's the literal cost of that. But it also, there's a social and political cost of that, right? It allows capital interests a commanding share in political mechanizations, including domestic and foreign policy. In other words, all of our systems and structures are built to perpetuate the system of empire. And it doesn't, they don't really care about us as citizens, right? All we're doing is feeding into that system. And of course, there's the lack of responsiveness from institutions of democratic inclusion, perpetuated by capital interests who seek profit over people. It enables capital interests to subvert principles of authority, to conduct themselves as they see fit, even against the will of the general public. And it undermines the power of the hardworking majority in engaging systems and structures of political action and inclusion. Need some water. I think we need a bottle of water. <laughs> But of course, like all empires, right, all empires have to fall at some point, right? Things come to decline. There is an end point to everything. Nothing lasts forever. And so we have to understand the twilight, the twilight of Western hegemony and the twilight of US hegemony. Although the neoliberal economic system has been a tremendous burden on the developing world, many nations continue to persevere and provide for themselves economic modes of development that promotes sovereignty and prosperity. Many nations in the post-war era had begun to industrialize and engage in global commerce. And while there was a disparity at first, over time these nations began to produce and even compete in the universal marketplace of goods, services, and ideas. Back real quick. This right here is a photograph of the port of Shanghai. In 2020, the port of Shanghai surpassed the port of Singapore as the busiest container port in the world. Now, the port of Singapore surpassed the port of New York <laughs> as the busiest port in the world not too long ago prior to that. It shows a global shift in economic and social development throughout the later half of the 20th century into the 21st century as the mechanizations of industry take root in the developing world, and the developing world becomes the developed world. As the developing world transitions into the developed world, new modes of economic growth are open for opportunity. Nations like the People's Republic of China have developed alternative modes of economic development, incorporating multilateralism as a core tenet. With Europe firmly recovered from the destruction of the Second World War, their dependence on the United States, including the adherence to its hegemonic policies, become less of a priority and less attractive in the long term. And of course, with the reemergence of the Russian Federation as a world power and the reemergence of new great powers throughout the globe present a challenge toward the unipolar world. Instead of promoting expansion toward global realignment for a community of nations. Um, and when we talk about community of nations, you know, this is the United Nations, but for a long time, Western interests have kind of dominated that institution. Now we see the rise of new powers and new institutions challenging and taking over, right? And those interests are being represented globally. But in the case of the United States, structures of control and systems of dominance, especially in the global level, must all eventually come to an end. The cost and pressures involved in maintaining a vast global strategic network that continues martial interventions necessary to perpetuate its, its existence, and the substantial burden in terms of both life and material, with the world returning to a state of parity it has become even harder to maintain the level of control necessary to, to continue the uh, systemic order as, as established by the United States after World War II. So, sorry, I'm like dry. This is a famous photograph. I'm sure we've all seen it pretty recently because it's a very recent photograph. This is from the fall of Kabul, and that was about two weeks ago. Um, and this is, a, this is a, you know, a helicopter. It's a CH-47D Chinook helicopter. It's landing on the top of... Uh, the U.S. Embassy, uh, presumably to uh, evacuate personnel and members there. And this whole American empire thing, it's very expensive. 
it's very cost it's very it's very cost inefficient and honestly it's not it's not sustainable and the people in power who represent us supposedly represent us they know that they understand that it is not a sustainable thing and they know that this can't last forever um, they, you know there are always been talks about well maybe we can shift the weight of the system away from the United States as its core and more to its periphery, right? So allowing countries like Saudi Arabia and Japan to take a more active role in maintaining this global system, right? The rules-based order in order to manifest itself, right? We have to, you know, kind of divvy out some of the, some of the responsibility because the United States, you know, they can't do it on their own. But of course, by doing that, right, a lot of these countries who do supposedly adhere to our global system, right? Uh, well, they have interests of their own we have to take that into consideration when we do divvy out that responsibility. But with all that being said and done, we have the concept of multilateralism. So nominally, multilateralism is the coordinated diplomatic interaction between three or more states. That's its basic definition at its core. But there are the qualitative aspects of it, right? Persistent and connected sets of rules formal and informal that prescribe behavioral roles, constrain activity, and shape expectations. In other words, when you have a multilateral relationship, it is not simply me knowing three other countries. It's also me knowing three other countries and having a common goal involved in that, right? Having a mutual interest that we all kind of share, right? And so we look at the allies of World War II. That's really the first multilateral global institution, right? They all have a common goal. They want to defeat the Nazis, right? You look at the United Nations, we all have a common goal. We're looking to promote human rights in a global form for peace, right? Well, now we have new modes of international development, right? New modes of multilateralism. China, for example, wants multilateralism. They have the Asian De uh, Infrastructure Development Bank, right? They want to have new systems of global capital to challenge the IMF and World Bank because a lot of countries in the developing world, they don't really like the IMF and the World Bank. I can't imagine why, <laughs> but, you know, the long and short of it is that there needs to be a new mode. So multilateralism, why it matters? Well, it allows for the applied features of international law and economic inclusion to provide and maintain peace and prosperity on the basis of mutual development. And it allows for the commonality and equitable representation in terms of policy practice on the world stage, often through the utilization of intergovernmental organizations like the United Nations or like this picture here of the International Court of Justice which is a UN-sponsored institution. You know, these things, they have been used a lot by Western hegemony to manifest global policy on their terms. But with the rise of the developing world, right, the countries like China and Russia and all these things, they can use the same, the same institutions the same way. And they can fight for the control of, of the world forum. They can fight for the control of the world narrative. And more importantly, they can fight for the control of sovereignty of the developing world as they continue to press onward towards peaceful development. Multilateralism provides a voice for the developing nations to have a say in international affairs. It undermines the central tenets of hegemony and imperialism as a matter of course of policy. It allows for the recognition of sovereign, sovereign states to pursue modes of economic development outside of the neoliberal economic system. And it establishes institutions set toward new multilateral aspects of financial and economic inclusion. Now, I mentioned recently the Asian Investment Development Bank, which is experienced by China, which many countries in Western Europe and Canada have also joined, by the way. The United States and Japan, for whatever reason, decided that was not a good idea. <laughs> but a lot of our allies did join this thing because they can see the benefits of this, right? They can see the benefits of economic development coming from ulterior and alternate sources, but also because a lot of countries in the developing world, having seen the 1990s, having experienced the, the mass austerity, the Washington Consensus, the IMF and the World Bank, literally deindustrializing parts of the world, they've seen that. They've seen the horrors of that. They've seen the cost of that, the cost of the famine in Ecuador, as Caleb mentioned. You know, these things are real. These things cost lives, not just money. It's not simply dollars and cents. It's human material. It's human dignity. It's humanity. And I think that's, that's a key facet we want to kind of touch upon as communists. So multilateralism toward an anti-imperialist world. I cannot stress this enough. This is a very important statement. 
the primary goal of the socialist movement of the United States is to combat hegemony and imperialism. The primary goal of the socialist movement in the United States of America is to combat hegemony and imperialism. to undermine the capacity of the United States to engage in martial actions globally, and to allow for the establishment and integration of the United States into a true international community of nations. To forward the advancement of peaceful development and utilization of our collective resources and technology for the benefit of all humanity. The system that exists doesn't benefit us. Oh, the system that exists doesn't benefit us, but what, what we can do is create a new system. And that's sort of the, the embellishment of what CPI kind of represents, right? We as an organization, we want to build a new system. I want to show you this picture. This is a very cool picture. Guess what city in the world this picture is from? I'll give you, give you like 10 seconds. This is the city Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. And it used to be one of the poorest cities in the world. But within the last 10, 20 years, with investment from China and the cooperation of countries around the world, and that looks like this. The possibility of utilizing our industries, our economic mode of development, and more importantly, the minds and spirit of the human race, we can build something that is really spectacular, a world without poverty, a world of abundance, a world of peace and freedom. So solutions for a post-imperial United States, laying the groundwork for a new era of political development, building the requisite foundations for the promotion of democracy, and establishing hope for justice, peace, and freedom. So why ideas matter? Action without theory has consequences. Theory without action has no consequence. <laughs> but action with theory has the solution. <clears throat> the importance of ideas in the process of creating change is not only crucial, but a necessity. Political engagement on the part of the socialist movement in the United States should be constantly reasserting itself and maintaining momentum toward bringing new ideas to the forefront for the effectiveness of political discourse. This idea that socialism is every book you've ever read that's ever existed previously, that nothing else could ever exist, that nothing else should ever exist, that is a lie. Mm -hmm. That is a falsehood. And they have told people that time and time again. We have to create new ideas because a does not equal A. But new ideas also have to come with new actions, new policies, and goals. We have to have things to reach towards. It's not all about saying the right thing. It's also about walking the walk and talking the talk. So to engage the political challenges of the 21st century requires strategies with objective development. Metrics for success must be implemented for the process of establishing actuated public policy and altering the domestic international political situation in a material reality, right? It's not just about talking about these things. We have to manifest that. We have to create change. We have to create policy. We have to get people fired up. Because if we don't do that, well, it's going to be the same old shit. And nobody wants that because here we are with the same old shit. It is not simply enough to participate, but it is crucial to provide leadership and concepts to reinvent the manifestations of political efficacy here in the United States. And that includes building a world for us as humans. So goals and solutions, right? Well, we want a recognition of sovereign states to pursue modes of economic development outside the neoliberal system of re uh, systemic regime, right? Yeah. 
Give me the bottle, bottle. Participating institutions set toward new multilateral aspects of financial and economic inclusion, right? A world beyond the IMF and the World Bank. No more Washington consensus, no more economic degradation on the account of austerity. Developing a new world. Developing a cooperative and mutually beneficial relationship with other industrialized nations to pursue the common prosperity and scientific benefit for all humanity. Sorry. We also want a return of strategic assets to allied nations, including the withdrawal of US combat, troops from, combat forces from the European continent and the negotiated delineation of arms reductions and strategic thresholds in the countries in opposition to the unipolar establishment. In other words, it's a bit, I know it's a bit long. I, I mean, you know, it's a long paragraph, but we want to see the U.S. withdrawal from NATO. Yeah. We want to see the U.S. withdrawal from Europe. We want to see troops out of Korea. We want to renegotiate our, our security treaty with Japan and troops out of Japan. We want to create a world where the United States the U.S. empire reduces itself to the point where it's no longer a threat to world peace. And we also want the general drawdown of planned uh, withdrawal of U.S. strategic assets in the Asia Pacific region and the Middle East, including the renegotiation and termination of unnecessary security treaties, as mentioned. But to do that, oh, the why move. To do that, uh, we, need, we need ideas. So then there's theory. <laughs> oh, well. So what does theory do? Well, it informs the basis of our understanding of the material world, but also allows for the development of new ideas to engage with our material conditions. So what does that allow us to do? Well, it allows us to establish new theories for the fun foundational structure of American socialism. That's right, folks. We're going new places now. We're creating new things. We're creating new ideas. It's no longer about Marxism-Leninism, although we build our perspective from Marxism-Leninism. We build on top of the shoulders of the greats, right? When we create new ideas, we build on top. We don't, we don't reinvent the wheel. We already have the wheel. We just move forward with it. We make it better. And so we're creating new systems, new theories, new ideas, a new form of ideology. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. We're doing it. It's happening. I don't know why. Okay. So we have information. This would say phase one. I don't know why it doesn't do that. But establishing unique platforms to bring new information to the general public. Obviously, for those of us on YouTube and in various forms of communication, they still control that, right? And so it's hard to address the general public. Well, even though we have the internet, it's constantly being monitored and censored and people being taken off, et cetera. We need to bring new institutions, new development to that. We need to have unique platforms that are unique to us. That's going to be a hard challenge, but I think we can do it. And providing access to the general public of information outside the periphery of the US-centric political uh, sphere, right? We have people like Convo Couch who are doing that work right now, engaging people beyond the mainstream, talking to people beyond that, right? We have CPI people. We have people who are involved in the organization who have been on the front lines trying to bring these new characteristics and new ideas to the American public, people outside of the United States, people who are you know, attacked by imperialism every day, right? We bring their perspectives to the forefront. We let the American people know what's going on. And finally, expressing and distributing that information in ways to engage the general public. We bring these ideas to the people, to the masses, right? Out of the movement to the masses. 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 Right? Expressing and distributing information to engage the general public, people to know what's going on globally. But of course, there's engagement, right? And there's many forms of engagement. How do we do this? Well, first, there's institutional engagement, right? We have the, the high end, the big picture stuff. Establishing targeted political action focused on both domestic and international institutions toward, to, for work toward multilateral and democratic development, right? We should challenge the International Monetary Fund. We should challenge the World Bank. We should tell them how bad their policies are. We should let them know mm -hmm. the statistics, the numbers, the, the number of people dead, right? We should let them know what's going on because 
Maybe they don't know, right? Or maybe they know and they don't care. Either way, we have to be able to present ourselves and engage with these things so that people know what's happening and so that they know how we feel about it. We also need policy engagement, developing programs and policies to actuate material political results. Not just ideas, not just talking about it, we need results, right? Ensuring those policies are sound and viable enough to be brought to the forefront of political discourse and engaging the US public. The idea of <laughs> Fusion City. Now. Yeah. Fusion City. Now. We have the Sandino uh, Zapata Economic Corridor, right? We talk about that a lot. I think that's a great idea. That's a fantastic idea. And if we can make that happen, we should. Because it would benefit a lot of people, not just in our country, but throughout the world. And especially the people who live there, right? But it's not just, it's not just engaging the lawmakers and the institutions that provide for those lawmakers. It's also about engaging the people, right? We have to have grassroots engagement, yeah. on the ground commitment toward the attainment of public involvement, actively challenging perspectives that promote pro-war and hegemonic defense narratives, and providing the general public a method of engaging with new ideas and developing the roots for change in their communities. This is a cool picture. And those of you who don't know who these people are, that's the John Brown Volunteers. They are doing great work in New York. And that's just one small part, one small part of a much larger operation, right? A much larger picture, people being involved in what we do. We want to engage the general public. And as we grow as an organization, things will change. And we'll get more people. And it'll snowball, right? It, it, it creates a bigger effect. So in the conclusion, the process of establishing the foundations of peace in our lifetime is not simply a matter of convenience, but rather it is indeed a matter of necessity. This is our historical material responsibility as communists in the United States. I want to say this again. This is our historical material responsibility as communists in the United States. It is those who have a theory and those who strive for action who will change the course of human events. But before I end, I just want to say a few things. I remember where I was and what I was doing on September 11, 2001. I was 11 years old. I remember the fighter jets and the news announcements and the emergency calls. I remember people desperately fleeing in pain and suffering. I remember people screaming in fear. I remember myself crying myself to sleep at night after 9-11, uh, and thinking that, you know, I'm not safe in my own home, being here. And for a long time, people in the United States, they, uh, they distance themselves from problems overseas. You know, they think it could never happen here. It could never be victim to these sorts of things. But that's where we're wrong, and we've been wrong. And if that could happen here, and if we can have those feelings, and imagine what the people who we've done this to. Mm -hmm. Imagine the families and the children and the people who've suffered at our hand. Yeah. We have a responsibility to build a better world. And I think we have the capacity to do that. And so I'm honored to speak to you all today. And I'm honored to fight with you forevermore. Right. It's all good.